Good evening. Um, my name is Haram Hospers. I'm the Dean of University College Maastricht. Um, there is a little story uh, part of this evening. Um, at a certain point, André Postema, the Vice President of Maastricht University, and myself um, had a plan to lure Fijke Sibusma to the Mindelbudersberg to give a talk. And we, th we were extremely happy that it didn't, didn't need a lot of convincing. He immediately said, of course. Um, and the only thing he said, I want to have a lot of students there, um, which I think we succeeded. Um, uh, and so I'm very happy with this turnout. Uh, we also asked uh, Fijke Sibusma to give a talk that would be um, food for discussion and also allow the audience to ask questions <coughs> after uh, the presentation. So, um, and also that there's time for that as well. Um, I think about half an hour after, we'll have time for about 30 minutes afterwards. So, this is a very interesting topic that uh, many young people at Maastricht University are interested in, the com combination of sustainability and business. Um, th there are many instances now within the university, uh, the best example may be Green Office, where a lot of young people, students, are involved in uh, setting up projects for all of Maastricht University. Uh, so this is um, very timely uh, to, uh, to introduce Fijke Sibus, my CEO, Royal DSM, to give a talk which is called Leading Businesses in the 21st Century Sustainable Entrepreneurship, Future or Dreams. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you very much to have the board of management of the university here completely on the first row. Uh, thank you for our interactions uh, over the years. Um, you see here the logo of the University of Maastricht on a slide of DSM. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> it's not always, uh, but on purpose, uh, because the university is very important for DSM, for this region, for the development of, um, of this part of the country. And our interactions with the universities, with the university, is very good, and I'm very proud uh, of being here. Together with you, students, um, you will have the opportunity to ask me some questions later on, but maybe also in between. So uh, from time to time, I'll ask you a question. And maybe to start with the first question, welcome also to you sitting over there. What do you have that I don't have? I start with the simple questions. <laughs> oh, gosh. You're sure it's all students, huh? <laughs> OK. What would you have that I don't have? Only the students. There are a few which are not students anymore, I hope. And what is that? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> no, maybe you're right. But if you're young, you have something which all people don't have. There's time and the future. So the future is in your hands. And that is why I love to be here and to speak with you, the next generation. That is why we set up in the World Economic Forum, I don't know whether you heard about it, the Young Global Shapers, people below 30. We have now 1,500 of those, and I'm mentor of some of the groups, especially the Amsterdam Global Shapers, uh, people younger than 30 years old uh, who can participate in Davos, where all the important CEOs and world leaders come together discussing the future of which they will not be a part of anymore. And therefore, we ask also young people to participate. And that is why I like to be here today. I would like to discuss four topics. Challenges of the world, the transition of DSM, the transformation of DSM, how DSM is further adapting and growing, and what do you think about the future our economy, and I need your help also over there. So, a world full of challenges. Welcome. So, my first question. Are you happy? 
It's a very interactive public uh, here in Maastricht. <laughs> More clear. Are you happy? Really, also upstairs? Are you happy upstairs? Not really. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> only correct, yeah, the only correct answer. Uh, here downstairs, they're much more happy, by the way. <laughs> Are you happy? OK. Can I steal the first 10 minutes uh, to make clear or to go into? Why are you so happy? Is there any reason to be happy? Maybe there are a few. I would like to discuss a couple of topics and discuss your spontaneous reaction why you're happy. There are 50 million people in the United States who live below poverty level 50 million in the richest country of the world. A lot of those people are obese. Because we arranged it like that in this world, that junk food loaded with carbohydrates and sugars and not other products is much cheaper than healthy food. So the 50 million below poverty level in the richest country of the world have diseases and have malnutrition Although when you look to a lot of people, you will say, well, you're well fed. Well, they aren't. Did you follow the news this afternoon? Did you heard about the 3,000 people who died? Did anybody follow the news? You were busy coming here. <laughs> 3,000 people in the last few hours of this afternoon. Anybody read it? Heard it already? No? It's happening every six seconds that there is somewhere in this world a mother who's losing her child because of malnutrition. 3,000 people this afternoon. It was not in your newspapers. It was not in the Limburger, I guess. And the national newspapers, for sure not. And you know what? It will happen again tomorrow afternoon. Will be people, will be mothers, every six seconds, losing somewhere in the world to a child. If you have an airplane crash or a car crash, with a few people killed, gets all the newspapers. Because it's very sad what happened with people who were killed in those accidents. And of course, that is very sad. But yeah, those thousands per day, I mean, on the right side, we get used to it. People in India, people in Bangladesh. I visited Somalia, refugee camps. I visited Ethiopia. And you know what? The Horn of Africa, 120 million people. It's an area where, in fact, you cannot live anymore today. <clears throat> it's very difficult to grow your vegetables and to keep your cattle in the Horn of Africa. Anybody know why? Because of climate change. It's hurting the south of Bangladesh and the Horn of Africa the most, ironically. Because for sure, they did not trigger the climate change. But they suffer the most at this moment. Yeah, indeed, climate change. Are you concerned about the climate? Or not? It was <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Great, my support today. <laughs> Me too. Um, did you follow that there is a new report of the International Panel for Climate Change? Do you, by the way, know what that is? It's the UN Climate Change Panel with a lot of scientists. But if you do not trust the UN, you can also look to the climate consensus. You can Google it, the climate consensus, and find out what 10,000 scientists are saying there. 
It's very interesting if you follow the surface of the scientists. Ten years ago, there were a lot more scientists who were skeptical about what's happening. Now listen, once in a while those polars are changing and the strength of the sun has a certain variance, which is all true, both facts are true. And therefore, I mean, let's not exaggerate it. Today, and they do every half year a survey, if you look at of 10,000 most influential scientists, by far most people of the of those that of most scientists are saying is, listen, there's much more carbon in the air. In the past it was underground, now it is in the air due to our fossil burnings. Carbon in the air, mankind induced carbon in the air which take care of the heating, carbon in the air which take care of the climate change. We already achieved in the last 50 to 100 years 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 degrees increase of temperature. We are on our way to achieve 2%. And nobody knows exactly, 2, 2 degrees, sorry. And nobody knows exactly what will happen between 2 and 6 degrees. Because what will happen between 2 and 6 degrees is that the northern ice areas are going to melt down and are going to emit methane, especially in the summertime. It's already happening today. Methane is coming out of northern areas in Greenland and Russia, etc., out of the ground, which was frozen in the past already today, the so-called permafrost. That's a very dangerous area because that could trigger a self-enforcing effect. So two could mean automatically six, could mean six, if we even decrease our output of carbon. Then even when we do that, we could have triggered a mechanism which will further increase it to six. Okay, who cares? A little bit higher dikes, we're good at that, new business for the Netherlands, what's the problem? Well, it's a big disaster for the Horn of Africa or Bangladesh, etc., and for many areas in the world. But also for us, we get new infectious diseases, biodiversity will go down in the world, we get new effects which we're not waiting for. So the effects of climate change could be tremendous. The melting of our Arctics, both in the north and the south, could have a tremendous impact on the way we live. But, cynical people said, I read in the new report of the International Panel for Climate Change that in the last 10, 15 years, the increase was not so bad. It's true. If you look in the last 50 or 100 years, it was very bad. And if you follow that line, and some of you have studied mathematics, that line is not a straight line up. That goes a little bit like this, and you have periods where it is easier and more difficult to see the change. That does not mean that if you see a little bit less the change over the last 10 years, that it is not happening. Although you can also look to other effects in the last 10 years. For example, the northern ice area, which has been uh, ice-free now in the summer, and which is very good news for the Japanese because they can use that road uh, to transport their ships uh, cheaper than before in a few months in the summertime. Are you rich? No, <laughs> you're students. Um, but you want to get a job later on. And there is a big chance, listen what I'm saying, this is good news for you, there's a big chance that you will belong to the billion richest people in the world. That's good news. There are seven billion people, so there's, there's a very high chance that you will all belong to the billion richest people in the world. Because already three billion, who, two billion who are starving from hunger, two billion in the world, one really starving from hunger, and the other one starving from hidden hunger, the shortage of micronutrition, etc. And then if you really look to poverty, 
And to other problems, you come for sure easily to 3 billion people who even do not count in this whole calculation who is the billion richest people in the world. Okay. After the good news, you know how much the billion richest people of the world are consuming. Between 40 and 50% of all raw materials of the world. If there will be 2 billion people, that will be a fair distribution. If there are 7 billion people growing to 9 billion people, that is not a fair distribution. Even stronger, whether it is fair or unfair, it is unsustainable. Don't think that the Chinese or the Indians or whatever would accept when their middle class will grow, would accept this distribution of the sharing of wealth in the world. It will not happen. It will not continue. If we do not learn to do less, uh, to do more, sorry, with less, then others will teach us to do less with less. Because other people will claim also their part of the pie, and rightly so. So, I promise you to nuance a little bit your own statement that you are happy. Are you happy? And please tell me why. Now the big question, of course, is, and these slides make me humble, who is responsible for all of this? If those problems I was talking about, the distribution of welfare, or climate change, or hunger, and I can go on and on, are real big issues for the world, who is responsible for that? In the past, there was a simple answer. Governments. We've organized the world in a private sector and a public sector. Private enterprises take care of themselves and generate jobs and take care of the economy. And we have governments who structure everything which is unfair. And they redistribute money, they get taxes, they take care of infrastructure. And governments take care of the overall of our society. Great model. Doesn't work anymore. My view doesn't work anymore. We need to redefine it. Why? Because companies developed themselves over the last 50 or 100 years. Now, companies who are bigger and I know a couple of companies who are bigger than one third of the countries in the world, who have more turnover than the brute national product of tens of countries in the world. There are companies who can have a huge and devastating effect on what is happening on this planet. There are companies who are drilling at certain places in the world which if it would really went wrong, and unfortunately it did not went, that whole coastal areas of certain continents would be unlivable for maybe 100 years. That is the impact that companies can have. I have also examples of good impacts companies can have nowadays. Companies can have a huge impact. And one thing I learned from my father and my mother, if you have impact, if you have power, you better show your responsibility. Nothing is a more dangerous combination as having a lot of power, a lot of impact, and showing a limited responsibility. That's a very dangerous combination, which we have seen, if we look back to history, several times. Having said so, that means that companies, including ours, have a huge responsibility to contribute to the problems we just discussed, even stronger. Partly, we are creating those problems. It is industries who are emitting the CO2. It's not the White House, nor the Katz House, who has a lot of emission of CO2. And we cannot say as companies to the next generation yourself, oh sorry, it was not me, eh? it was Balkenende or Rutte or Obama or Merkel, they could not agree. So, yeah, therefore, we needed to continue to uh, emit uh, the CO2 like our competition was doing, and we had no choice. 
that we cannot say to the next generation we had no choice. The government could not arrange it, so we needed to continue. That cannot be a statement, especially not with so much impact as we have today as companies. So for me, the whole paradigm is a little bit changing towards a strong responsibility for companies as well. I was in Rio plus 20, and even there, at a certain moment, with a couple of companies, which a small group I was leading, we said, and there was mainly the governments who were in charge, and there were companies supporting them and are circling around them. And with a group of companies, we want to make a further pledge on addressing climate change. And I asked a debate with some of the governmental representatives. And I will not list the names of the people nor the countries, although some of the countries were not very exotic and are abbreviated sometimes with NL as well. But um, some of the countries told us as business, we cannot do that. We cannot take a next step. Our voters will not like it. I said, why not? Listen, listen. There is a crisis out there, an economic crisis. So that is what we missed as companies. Thank you very much for the information. <laughs> Most likely we missed it. Um, so governments are also sometimes stuck in what their own voters want and with their own perception of reality. So therefore, businesses need to stand up as well. I will come back on that. Um, please. Fair, fair point is that, well, it's not only governments, it's not only companies, but it's mainly consumers who have the responsibility. And I, to a certain degree, agree with you. It is not only governments, and it is now not only companies, but it is more groups. NGOs put it on the agenda, have also a certain responsibility to put it continuously on the agenda. But you're right. At the end of the day, it is also consumers who have a responsibility here. Absolutely true. I quote here, Raina Otsuka, I never heard of her, 28-year-old girl out of Japan, one of those young global shapers, and I've quoted her a lot, and I should stop with her because it gets too many emails around the world. But uh, she was in one of the discussions, in a panel discussion I was with a lot of CEOs, and especially with some consumer companies, and she said, please, stop calling me a consumer. I am not a consumer, I'm a user, a user of the reservoir of resources, and I would like to use that in such a way that also next generations can use that. And for me, consumption feels very much as eating it up and nothing is left. So I want you to call me differently. Oh, there's an important CEO sitting next to me, he said, who is she? I said, I just met her, Reinhold Suga. Never heard about Big company? I said, well, 100% uh, more than yesterday because she hired a second person, so we are now with two persons, um, which I heard from her. But I fully agree, consumers have a responsibility, but the often heard argument of consumers is that they don't always have the choice. Uh, do you have the choice to choose really for green energy in the Netherlands? I can talk long about what is really green energy in the Netherlands and how that actually works with certificates out of Norway. Um, but yeah, but you have a choice to choose for economic expansion products. True. True. I totally agree. I will continue, I will not do the full debate now. But I, I fully agree with you that consumers have a responsibility, and I fully and I'm even glad you say so. I would disagree that if consumers say only we are the hopeless consumers, what can we do? No, totally not. You can do a lot with your behavior. 
you can, as they say, vote with your feet by just your actions. And listen, a lot of consumers have unified themselves to the third largest country in the world. Facebook, 800 million people. Only China and India are bigger. And the moment you put it on Facebook, you can share it with 800 million other people around the world. And a lot of people do that, so fully agree. Maybe a sidetrack here. This social media is a very important thing which is happening. You see, sort of consumer companies already suffer, building on your point, that people put in complaints via Facebook and Twitter, etc. Because via the normal help desk, it takes them ages. So they put it just on Twitter and just on Facebook. And then companies react very fast because they're afraid that other 800 million people are seeing that. Which is a good thing, but also bad, because then all people think, hey, this works much better than calling the help desk. They put it all in Twitter. Here you see the power consumers have. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Our company has also to contribute to these problems. And I would like to, to show a little bit what our company is doing and how it changed over time. I will do it also in time. Our company has changed a lot, DSM. And I'm a biologist. I've said that more often. Uh, I was grown up with Darwin. And you know uh, his quote of one of the most famous books in the world, The Origin of Species. To my own surprise, comma, to my own surprise, I was really surprised. It is not the fastest, not the biggest, not even the strongest, but the fittest who will survive. And the fit is not the one who went most to the gym, is most fit, but the fit is the one who adapts the most to the changing environment. And that counts for animals, that counts for species, but why not for countries, why not for organizations, why not for uh, all kinds of institutions as well? And I think it does. So what we did over the years is changing ourselves. I can talk hours into what we changed and why we changed. This moment, the company, roughly a little bit less than 10 billion uh, euro sales, uh, 25,000 people, a lot work in R&D and technology. Innovation plays an important role. And financially, a solid company in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which we are already for nine or 10 years, one of the leaders, uh, is a very important representation of, of the company. Started as a coal mining company. And at a certain moment, we thought, if we continue with that, it will not last long, because one day, it will change. Well, there were a couple of people here in Limburg who said, it will never change. And by the way, we can prove it will never change. Because 40% of the Netherlands is using coal of DSM. If 40% of the Netherlands will stop with using coal of DSM, then the Netherlands will stop. And since the Netherlands will stop, coal will not stop, and DSM will not stop. So we don't have to change. Minutes of the managing board in the 50s and the 60s of our company. Evidence is there. And some people say, ah, well, you never know. Let's move into chemicals and other products because the world can change. A few years later, gas was found in the northern part of Holland, not in the southern part. And the country just did change quite rapidly. And in, 90, uh, in the 60s, uh, the prime minister, Danel, uh, closed all the mines. And that was the end of the mining activities of DSM. And fortunately, we have changed ourselves at that moment into a chemical company. Uh, and we became a chemical, bulk chemical, petrochemical company. Then later on we thought, will that continue forever? Of course, without petrochemicals, without chemicals, the world will stop. You cannot wear clothes, you cannot drive a car, you cannot do anything, etc. But we said, well, if biotechnology, etc., will play any more important role, uh, it can also switch to other technologies. Secondly, most likely, it will be dominated by people in the Middle East where the NAFTA is coming for free out of the ground, where we have to buy it. So what we did, if you look back, the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 15 years, the last 20 years, changed ourselves again. And we changed also the terminology from chemical company to, uh, from a bulk chemical company to a chemical company to a fine chemical company, specialty chemical company, a life sciences and material science company. So, we developed our portfolio and changed our, our names as well. Here on the right side, you see the portfolio as we have today in material sciences on the top part and life sciences on the bottom. Life sciences is food and pharma. We are the largest food ingredient manufacturer in the world. Material sciences, high performing materials. That is the portfolio of today. And you see 
that in 1995, only 30% of the company uh, was in the same areas, and 70, by far the majority of the company, and most of the profit, by the way, was coming out of the gray area, which we do not have anymore. So we changed ourselves in these last 15 years drastically, and already for the second time in, in, in history. And we changed our company to something which we completely knew. I mean, you can say, yeah, you know, one small advertisement compared with Philips and Shell and AXO and Unilever. They all changed. Sure, Unilever is still making butter, AXO is still making salt, Philips still making lamps, and Shell, I guess, still in oil business. Uh, not saying anything negative to those companies who I like very much and I have a lot of respect, so be clear on that. Nothing negative to those. But I want to give you an impression, what is the impact of our company? Because we stopped completely with mining and we stopped completely with petrochemicals. We did not add something to that, we changed. And that had a lot of impact on the company, doing something completely different, on the management, on the culture, on the portfolio, on the rules, on the regulations, on everything. How did we do so? By being predetermined. We knew what we wanted, and of course, whilst driving that, we were busy with all kinds of things, and sometimes the world was against us and not helping us, but we kept our course. What we also did is stopping on time with certain activities, and divesting those, or stopping with those on time. Often a big problem for companies in a transformation. You always stop with your core activities. Yeah, we still eat from it. I mean, let's wait a little bit. Maybe add, but let's wait. Till you've waited too long and said, well, now it is so lousy, we can divest it, and then it will not bring you any money, and you have not the capabilities to transform yourself and run into a problem. It's not the problem as we had. Yeah. <laughs> Advertisement, Superspan, what is this? <laughs> okay, true. But I would like to say, all of those who say, hey, this whole drive for sustainability, different portfolio, etc. cetera, um, what about the tension with creating shareholders' value? Sustainability must be in great contrast with sus sustainability and shareholders' value must be in great contrast to each other. Totally untrue, according to me. Those two can go very well together. And here you see, and I was not even that arrogant was I need to be to do that with, with some humbleness to put 2013 in there because I guess in 2013 the increase we made on the stock exchange is maybe three times the AX, so the differenti differentiation would be even stronger. What is our strategy today? We have created the portfolios here at the bottom life science, material sciences. We want to grow via four important growth drivers, the high growth economies, innovation, sustainability, acquisition partnerships, addressing the trends we were discussing, the issues on food, the issues on climate change. And why? Because we are so noble also, but also because there's a business model to address those things. It would be very strange if the world is not spending an important part of its money to address its biggest problems. So it's good that companies enter those fields and contribute to the solutions, and I think it is a sustainable business model as well. Our mission. It's not a mission which many companies have and with the CEO have to look like, what was it again? Yeah, that is our mission. Uh, now I read it, it sounds even good. Now this is a mission of which 25,000 people in DSM globally believes in. And if I read our engagement survey, which we do every year, I see very much how much it gives energy to our own employees that next to having a job and paying their car and their mortgage, etc., they can contribute to make this world a little bit a better place by addressing the things we mentioned. That means also we need to work for different stakeholders, not only our shareholders, but of course also our shareholders, because there's nobody yet who brings every Friday afternoon a truckload of money and put it at the doorstep of DSM. That model was not yet invented by us. So we need to make our own money, and if not, the show will stop. And we need to keep shareholders satisfied, otherwise they will turn us against us. But we need to do much more than that. 
We need to contribute to society. We need to contribute to this planet. We need to contribute to our customers, etc., etc. People, planet, profit. That is our model, and I will come back on that. That's for me very essential. Here you see our financial targets, which we have formulated in the past, but you see also that we have clear sustainability targets. So we have clear targets where you should judge us how we are improving there, and even a part of our remuneration is dependent on that. That is what DSM did in the past. Now we want to further grow. Further grow via those, your question. Correct question. True. He said, well, it's nice that you change and do all those great stuff, but partly other people are now doing that less great stuff, so is Mother Earth better off or not? A um, couple of true answers. It is not only out of the reasons of improving the world that we changed ourselves. It is also because of the continuity or sustainability, if you want, of the company itself. We felt if we do not change ourselves that we will be out of the game at a certain moment. From coal mining to chemicals, from chemicals to life science material science. Fighting, working on the continuation of our company. That was clearly an argument. Maybe the world is not helped with that, our shareholders were helped with that, our customers were helped with that, our employees were helped with that, this region was helped by that, but not everything. In addition, uh, we had the vision many times of the elements how the world could change. If I take, for example, the inroad of biotechnology in the chemical industry and making that greener and cleaner, it's a philosophy we have. If you do not enter that, we even said it is a threat. If you enter that, it is an opportunity, an opportunity to make this world also a better place. But I agree, it is not true that we can claim, and I'm not claiming that at all, so in that sense you're right, that all those activities and partly activities maybe where the world should rethink about how far we want to continue those, that they're all changed overnight by our change of portfolio. Absolutely uh, true. I will come back on that, how I look in that problem, because it's a very fair question further. Yeah. Well, well, my remark would be pretty much along, along uh, the same lines. Um, last week I visited um, Unilever Research and the right. Parliament, and they actually had pretty much a similar type of thing as you're presenting here with respect to I know. sustainability and these types of things. So can you give some clue on, on how unique you are or maybe you and Unilever are yeah. with respect to the, the focus on sustainability? And yeah. Unilever and ourselves are pretty, pretty much aligned that you can find, if I finish my total story, if uh, today you will find even more uh, similarities. Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, is a good friend, and we think on many of those topics quite aligned. Um, yeah, exactly. So you, 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 you found that out yourself via visiting. I cannot say, and I will come back on that, that all companies in the world are on the same trajectory. Fortunately, more and more companies in the world. Uh, let me come back on that. So how we want to, to, to grow via those four growth factors. Now, what we did is further establishing our uh, business. Here you see the companies we acquired in the last two and a half years. So, a rapid further change, and now becoming really uh, one of the most important players if you talk about food ingredients, if you talk about malnutrition, etc., in the world. That's also the reason why we said we should now put a halt a little bit on big acquisitions. We did a lot of acquisitions, I want to integrate those further. Because changing a company is not only on one end divesting and acquiring another part, hey, that we have changed the company. No, it is divesting and acquiring some others and looking for some others who fit with that others you already acquired, harvesting the synergy, growing organically, doing another acquisition, etc. If you just sell and buy, you will see that financially you will go bankrupt. Because most likely you sell a little bit too cheap and you buy a little bit too expensive and if the only added value is to selling and buying, then most likely financially that whole model will not work out and will not help you. So the whole change and the transformation of a company is a very delicate and a very precise process. 
Second deal, high growth economies. You know what this is, right? <coughs> you know what this is? Maybe upstairs. You know what this is, huh? It's the, huh? It's the world, yeah. That's correct? <laughs> no. University of Maastricht, not bad. But it's not the way the map you got at school, or I got at school. Um, because uh, at school, you get this part there, that part there, right? And then by coincidence, the Netherlands is exactly in the middle of the world. But you know, because you are students of Maastricht University, that the world is not flat, but it's a ball, so you can look from several angles to the world. And it is good to look sometimes from the other side to the world. And if you look from the other side to the world, the world looks this. By the way, that is how Asians are being taught at school, how the world looks like. Exactly like this. Um, and then the Netherlands is still on the map, uh, but in a corner. And more important, the growth in the world is happening in that blue area. I need to make a hole for Japan, but I found that so that I said, no, that I'm not going to do. But for the rest, it is Asia and Latin America where most of the growth is. And maybe what I believe that circle's becoming a little bit bigger into Africa as well. That's what we are investing in right now. But not in the United States and not in Europe, there's not the majority of the growth. 70% of our growth in the last period, in the coming period, is coming out of that area. And logically, because the increase of people is the highest in that area, and logically, because the middle class is developing. In fact, what is happening is that that part of the world want to participate also in the economic wealth of the world. What did that meant for us? Ah, the picture as we got it at school. The Netherlands safe in the middle. What we did is we moved a lot of our headquarters, our business group, global headquarters, to the different regions in the world. In the past, everything was in uh, Limburg. Uh, every global headquarter of every, every business was located at Sittard or Heerle. I mean, where else? Well, Ermond sometimes, but that's it. <laughs> and we said, well, that is not where the majority of the growth will happen in the world. So we will need to relocate some of our global headquarters to different regions to get different views, different perspectives, also to our headquarters. Third, I do it fast. Uh, innovation, the third driver of our growth. And this is a video uh, where I'm not going to show, but uh, once we have more time, one other time we visit us, I will show you the video of young um, kids of our R&D and innovation directors uh, solving a certain game. And our people were astonished how they did that and what was the difference between the different age categories. Uh, around five years, around 10 years, around 15 years, and they were highly impressed how the kids around five years solved the problem. And not by asking five other questions, but the rules were like the 15-year-olds did, and at the end coming up with two solutions in their group because they could not agree on one solution. But the youngest group had it the fastest. There was a young, this young lady, and we talked about innovation, and she found a very difficult word and she mixed up invitation and innovation and came to the word innovation. And we said, that is what we keep. That is, in fact, what open innovation need to be for our company, innovation. That is a much better word than innovation. And what we're doing is developing new businesses uh, via open innovation, discussing with universities, with other groups, etc. cetera. Uh, biomedical. Very important, new area, materials for in the human body. We all become older and we need body parts to be replaced. Your hips, knees, spine disc, valves. Now, what we did in the automotive in the past, uh, we can do in the human body nowadays. And it's very important because we all become older and nature did not develop us to last 80 years, but only 40 years. We were for 100,000 years, 40 years, but now we become 80 years, that's very nice. But the moving parts of our body are not designed to last 80 years in full use. They get worn out, then the, the, the structure was not designed 
to work for eight years. So yeah, you need a new hip, you need a new spine disc, you need a new knee, etc. And yeah, and we're going to provide that. Bio-based products and services using agriculture as a raw material for chemicals or for fuels, and not the food component, but the specials, the waste component, the leaves, the roots, etc. I'm astonished and amazed myself, diving further into our business here, how less the agriculture industry is optimized. The petrochemical and oil industry has optimized their industry in the last 150 years to the last tiny little detail. Everything is recovered, recycled, etc. The agriculture industry throws away between 30 and 50% of its potential after 10,000 years of exploring that area. Much more to be done over there. Advanced services, solar, uh, an invention I think many of you maybe have heard about it. Uh, we made this beautiful coating for picture frames, uh, a new coating, uh, very beautiful, not uh, fully transparent, no reflection of the light, beautiful. Um, very expensive, but beautiful. It makes your picture frame that you use at home at least six times more expensive, but it's really you have something then. Um, yeah, your laugh was the market laugh also. A beautiful product, no market, no sales. Uh, at almost the selling and funeral of the project, one guy said, but what are we doing here? We talk about reflection of light. Maybe in solar, that will be very important. Not to send it back to the sun, but to uh, use all the light in the solar cell. I mean, maybe those people want to pay for that, and maybe that's a much more innovative uh, solution. Here you see also how innovation works. Uh, some of our innovation come not out of a clear, straight line process, but out of different thoughts where people uh, from us at a certain moment came on. Sustainability, the fourth growth driver, uh, you still remember where I am in my storyline, that I say after creating DSM as it was, today, those four things, I started with acquisitions, I did, uh, addressed high growth economies, innovation, sustainability is the fourth one. Sustainability, we discussed, is of course um, uh, an important value, an important responsibility for us. But sustainability over the years became also a business driver. Partly we make our money with sustainability. Almost 50% of our sales need to be eco plus in 2015. Today it is around 40 and it's coming in 2010 from 30%. Products which have a clearly lesser environmental footprint than alternatives. And we are pushing our portfolio. Our pipeline need to be for me 80% like that. It is around 90% at this moment. So the company is changing its products. What we're doing is we're pushing, partly coming back to your question about what kind of products we want to have in our portfolio, pushing towards solutions and products which are eco-friendly. I um, have a lot of solutions, but uh, we'll not go into all of those, maybe in the Q&A. But one thing, you see partly our problems, is clean cow. Uh, cows take care of 15, 18% of our greenhouse gas emission in the world. And we can solve that to a certain degree. Now, that's great news. And also nice business. That's great news, and it's not a nice business, because we sell almost nothing. Because we go to farmers and say, do you want to reduce uh, your emission of your herd for, for a greenhouse gas emission? He said, yes. Okay, use these products, enzymes and other products, into your feed, mix it, and then it will reduce. It's a tremendous solution. Okay, do I need to pay for your products? Yeah, that, that is the only default. Yes, please. You need to pay for those products. And then most farmers in the world, no, all farmers in the world said, no, please, uh, don't. And by the way, I'm not taxed or get any burden of any government for the farting and burbing of my cows. So uh, who cares? And here you see that we're also sometimes struggling. Is hey, how the business model should look like, and we are thinking about how to address this and how to solve this, uh, to get those products, innovations, which are there, contributing to the world. But sometimes there is no market for it yet. Also, and I come back on that, because of the conventions as we made. How do you lead 
a company. That's also one of the things that Andre and we, we discussed. Tell also something about the leaders you, you want. If you look into that whole transformation and transition, what kind of people do you need? Now here I need a little bit of interaction. I will show you in a second how I look to the leaders we need and what kind of characteristics they need to have. But please, your contribution first. That makes it more fun to see whether I was right or wrong. What kind of elements, if you want to be a leader of a, of a company, or maybe a government or whatever organization for me in the future, what, what do you need to do? Where do you need to be good in, according to you? Sorry? Decision making. Listening. Listening. Not decision, listening. Leading. It's a little bit in the words. Eh? Uh, well, <laughs> leaders need to lead. <laughs> Creative, innovative. Inspire people. Have a vision. Make decisions. Judgment. Pragmatic. Be responsible. Earn the trust. Earn the trust. Be bold. Be bold. Earn the trust and be bold. <laughs> Good. And modest. And modest. <laughs> and flexible. <laughs> How great. Adaptive. Adaptive. This is the answer we gave. I like very much, I don't know, remember who said it. The first word was mentioned was listening. When we start with leaders, we start with insight. Insight in yourself and insight in others. If you cannot reflect on yourself, if you do not know who are you yourself, with all your default strengths and weaknesses, you will never become a good leader. If you don't understand yourself, forget it. If you do not have the guts to look to yourself and your own defaults, forget it. Secondly, insights in others. And to have insights in others, you need to have listening and observation skills. I mean, there are some people who listen via talking, but it is easier to listen via not talking and to observe other people and to get an impression about how other people are doing, what ticks them, what is their strengths and weaknesses. We say our leaders need to have insight. And then secondly, and I think you all mentioned that, what we call shape and connect, we need to have a vision. As a leader, you need to go somewhere. You need to have a direction and a passion and a decisiveness to go where. If you go nowhere, at least you always reach your goal. But if you go nowhere, uh, nobody knows what, what direction we need to go. Whilst at the same moment, not in contradiction to that, be modest. Uh, inspire people, be connected, because you will not achieve anything alone. So if you have a vision, it's great, and some people say, well, that's enough. The rest is followers. I'm the leader, right? So I need to have a vision, and the rest need to follow me, then it will come okay. No, no, no. If the rest is not connected to you or your vision, they will not follow you, and they will not go with you, and your vision is worthless, because you will be right but you will not get it. And later on, what was the added value for the company then? Yeah, I always said we should not start this project. Nobody understood me, but I say it already for years. Who cares? If nobody follows you, if nobody's connected with you, then it has very little meaning than an academic, ooh, an academic value of being right in hindsight for a study, but it has not helped your company. And at the end of the day, we want to have an output an output in delivering results, because we need to achieve also something and to have imagined what you want to do. It's not yet that you are there, and at the same time, develop other people. I don't know whether you looked on YouTube to one of the most inspiring short movies I have seen of leadership, leaders and followers. There are thousands of those on YouTube, but there's one and very funny, which I always keep in my mind, what also makes leaders. And this is a guy you see, sorry, you see a guy with a lot of people on a kind of grass and beach type of thing, and he, you've seen the movie? You've, you've seen it, you've seen it. I all have seen it and I don't tell it. 
Um, and the guy started dancing at a certain moment and doing strange. He's a leader, a leader of the whole group. And there's the second guy who follows him and who does exactly the same dance and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And at a certain moment, the whole group is dancing like that. And some people say, and I realize that very often, it's not about this leader. It's not about this first guy. It's about the second guy. It's all about the second guy. It makes me humble and make, put me on the place where I need to be. It's the second guy who made it. If the second guy, if there would never have been a second guy, the first guy would have not been a leader. He would have been a weirdo. <laughs> and since the second guy was there and more people were there, it made the leader to a leader. You can say he had some skills of connectivity to other people who are transferring that. This is the roadmap for DSM, um, how we deal with our organization. On the left side, you see our mission, what we want to mean for the world. We want really to contribute to make this world a better place. On the right side, you see our values. And what we want to do and our values are driving our strategy. In the middle, you see our strategy, and you've seen that already. And on the right and the left side, supporting our strategy, you see our culture change program of the things we need to change because we have a different portfolio today than we had in the future. We do not only adjust our portfolio, but also our culture fitting with that portfolio. I will not go in, uh, in depth too much on that. On the right side, our leadership. Then we come back on the last part of my presentation. It's all about you. If you look to the first part of my presentation about the issues of the world, if you look to how one single company dealt with it, DSM, maybe good, maybe bad, absolutely things we need to improve. I'm not standing here that we did or are doing everything perfect. Totally not. But I'm standing here with a genuine belief and attitude that companies next to consumers, next to governments, can contribute something of making this world a better place. And we're not doing everything right. But we need to do something to address the issues we just mentioned. I have two boys, 14 and 16. I cannot tell to them when I'm leaving this planet, well, we had a great life. I hope you too. I need to have a more in-depth discussion with them. Like, well, we did not inherit this world in the most perfect state, although not bad either. And we had a good life, but we tried to contribute to that and improve it so that you can further build on that also. That is the type of discussion I genuinely believe we need to have. Because, and I've used that statement many times, you cannot be successful, or not even call yourself successful, even if you think you are successful, in a world that fails. We are all a part of that global village. You cannot say, as you do not say in a family, if you're doing well, but your kids are ill, and your wife is in a depression, if people meet you, you're not saying, well, it goes okay with me. Well, not with the rest of the family, but with me, it goes very much okay. Most likely you will say, no, it's not going okay with me, because of the rest of my family. And why is that different for the world as a total? Why is it different that if this afternoon 3,000 people died, it's not in a newspaper, and when two people died, it was in a newspaper? People plan a profit. For me, we all need to contribute. All companies in the world, coming back to Unilever, we are very much aligned on this philosophy, we have a triple, triple bottom line. Of course we need to create profit. If you don't create profit, it will stop. But we need at the same time, not as a derivative, at the same time, contribute to this planet, at the same time, contribute to society. As three primary goals. And here I have discussions with some people in the World Economic Forum and other places. And here the discussion starts. And some people say to me, 
that is not completely true. Because your prime goal as a company is to make profit. Are you not owned by your shareholders? Yes, I'm owned by my shareholders. So your prime goal is profit. And then derived goals are to doing good for this world. As a derivative of that, you cannot screw it up. You need to do it correctly. You cannot pollute the world. But it's not your task to improve the world. It's your task to make profit. Is the philosophy of some. And is not my philosophy. My philosophy is we have three primary goals. People, planet, profit. And we need to contribute simultaneous at the same time to all three goals. Does that create tension sometimes? Does that create difficult decisions? Yes. Therefore, we have all those leaders we just discussed to deal with that. Three prime goals we have at the same moment. And here I agree more and more with some companies, and for sure you can add Unilever in that uh, uh, list, uh, but not with all companies of the world, yet. And some people said, listen, don't try to play for government. And I said, this is an old-fashioned model. Because of the impact of companies is so big nowadays, because our power, if you want to use that word, is so big, we need to have that responsibility as well. Governments do not have the innovative power, do not have the reach sometimes to address all those problems by themselves. Nor even sometimes consumers have, although they have more power sometimes than they think or use. I agree. So here is the task of companies. Therefore, our mission is to create brighter lives for people today, generations to come. And if you do not want to do it for society today only, but also for generations to come, you per definition talk about this planet and your contribution to this planet. Now, that's great news if companies do that. Is that baked in into our economic reality and economic system? Any reaction? No is the right answer. Because the valuation of companies is for 95% your contribution to your economic uh, value creation, to your profit. That will determine the valuation of your company. And it's very nice if you do something on the other ones, but it's not determining the valuation of your company. Now, if you really do a bad, what some companies have, that the existence of the company is becoming in danger because you did so much spillage or whatever that your whole company, then your share price might go down and then your valuation is negatively influenced. But for most companies, whether you do it mediocre or good or very good or excellent, it doesn't make any difference in the valuation of your company or very little. And here I think we should think about new economic models, new economic reality. And I have written some articles on that, for example, in The Guardian, about systems of how we could do that. And I know I have not the solution. I tried and I contribute and I put some thoughts there, how we could design the economy to the future. And I'm not even an economist. I'm a biologist with an MBA, <laughs> economist will say. And they are right also. So there are other people who are much better in helping me with that. But if we really want to have an automatic drive and not need to wait till all companies uh, do this automatically by themselves, then we need to think also about how we design the economy. And there are a couple of solutions, and there are a couple of things on that. And at this moment, there are many initiatives which we participate in. EP&L, to calculate what is the impact on the environment you as a company have. True value, true pricing, to find the true pricing. Solar is totally uncompetitive, some people say. Look to Germany, 20 billion per year. Okay, better focus on coal, like we do in the Netherlands. 4% sustainable energy, 96% non-sustainable energy, fossil-based. Uh, and most power plants in the Netherlands we put back to coal. Uh, we have one gas left and the rest is based on coal. Economically, most likely true. It's the cheapest solution. And of course, we need to take care of our economy also in Europe, absolutely. But this is at the end the solution. And is it true that coal is really cheaper than solar? Absolutely. Oh, yeah? 
a lot of what is economical for me is a matter of convention. Were there not people in the southern part of the United States 200 years ago who were saying to the people in the north who want to abandon slavery, it's not about human dignity. We're not talking about human rights. We agree to abandon slavery. This is economic reality. If we have to pay for labor forces, cattle prices will increase. You cannot wear clothes anymore. It has nothing to do with human dignity, our resistance. It's all to do with an economic reality. At the end of the day, rightly so, we abandoned slavery, we changed the convention, and we still wear clothes most of the time. So, it's partly also a convention for me, what is economically. And here you see also that the solution at the end of the day for me has to do with governance, with companies, with consumers. And with diversity of thoughts. <coughs> Different nationalities need to address this. The Asians, from their perspective, not coming from a Jewish Christianity uh, background, but from a Buddhist, Confucianism, Shintoism background, it's very interesting. They can contribute to this. But let me list another category 50% of the world population women. Men and women. And that we need also for me, to address this problem. Now, it is not true that all men are looking like the upper picture and uh, that all women are alone and they look uh, like this lady. But still, I made it like this. And why? Because it has something to do with men and women. But it has more to do with where the power and the main line of thinking is. And in many organizations, the male thinking is the dominant factor and is by far in the majority. Last, last part. Our contribution as DSM to the World Food Program, to the United Nations. As I mentioned, for me, it is one of the most astonishing problems. We put people on the moon, we do all kinds of things, and we have every afternoon jumbo jets which go down with people in it because we cannot solve it. We have mothers all over the world who give birth to their children and we do not give them the chance to feed their own children. And this is why DSM seven years ago started with the collaboration with the United Nations World Food Program and that has been very successful. Today we are helping 15 million people and we want to ramp it up in 2015 to 30 million people. I know we talk about 2 billion people. I know it's a drop, but I know we are also in this whole universe, maybe a big company, but also a small company. If all kinds of companies in the world would take up their responsibility and help tens of millions of people with many companies in the world, we can address 2 billion people. Another thing that we did and I'm very glad with that, in the discussion we had with Kofi Annan, with Ban Ki-moon later on especially, is discussing what is the type of help we give. And we officially changed the mandate of the United Nations from food security, from emergency help, towards emergency and development help. Because we are helping refugee camps. I visited refugee camps in Somalia. We're helping some of those camps already for 20 years. And we say, yeah, it's emergency help. So we do not need to provide the micronutrition, et cetera. We can give them some carbohydrates, and that's just clear. Yeah, but only when it was meant as emergency. Yeah, but this all meant as emergency, and not as development aid. This is a political United Nations mandate discussion. And we helped to invent a new word. It's called resilience. So we are now busy with emergency and resilience resilience that the emergencies happen again. At home we don't call that development, but don't tell them. Um, uh, and this is an official uh, change in the mandate. And I'm very happy that the United Nations is following that direction now and is taking up a much broader responsibility here. This is a picture from Bangladesh. Um, people standing in a line for their weekly or monthly food 
uh, profession which they get. Especially women, we learn very much that women are by far the best category to discuss these topics and not the head of the families in many countries, the men. They make a mess out of it, take everything themselves in the first day. They don't spread it over the week, don't spread it with the family. Sorry guys, but I'm not impressed what I've seen of men managing this problem. But I'm very much impressed I've seen women managing this, this issue around the world. So we especially um, uh, discuss with women in, in many countries, huge difference in approach. Beautifully dressed, you might say. Are they really so poor? Yeah, they share such a song with 20 women, sometimes 25. And they wear it at the day, day it's their turn to get their food. Why? Everything to do with dignity. Because they feel you are touching their dignity that they have to stand up in a line. And they want to compensate for that loss of dignity to be there in a the line with the way they are dressed up. Especially amazed in schools I visited in Ethiopia, discussing with girls of 10, 12 years old, going to those schools because there is food, not because to learn something. Their parents said you have to go to the cities and back, etc. But if they provide you school, as a food at school, go to school. One mouse less to feed. And at school, teaching children mathematics, English, etc. I was amazed being in the northern part of Ethiopia and discussing there with girls of 10, 12 years old, girls in English, calculating, etc., where their parents have not any clue how numbers go, uh, cannot write, cannot read, etc., and they do it even in English. I mean, very much impressed, and I don't know what will happen with them, but they have more capabilities developing and building their society than their parents had. And that I already mentioned. Thank you. Yes, time for some, some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I took a little bit longer. I needed to finish a little bit before eight. Sorry for that. Uh, it's now quarter past eight, but we still have 20, 25 minutes for some questions before we go to the rings. Please. I will try to get Mike first to you. So you mentioned before that governments are not really willing to, to help. So could you give some examples of what you would want from them? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't put me word into my mouth. <laughs> I did not say that governments are not willing to help. I said, please realize in what kind of environment they live. Governments um, uh, are always confronted with the fact they need to be re-elected and they need to work for their voters. And you see a change in governments around the world from the past where many politicians were seeing what they thought. And then you could vote on those who you like towards a little bit of change system where not all but many politicians are saying what they think the voters like because then they vote on them and the whole development of media and social media has helped that further. Logically, but it makes them to a certain degree hostage of what they think their voters want. And if they think their voters want uh, not a loss of jobs and if they think their voters think that due to sustainability you get a further loss of jobs then they will not be willing to go that route with you. I'm not saying that they are not willing themselves, but they see a problem cl close into their, 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 their future elections. What I would like to see, the same as I would like to see with companies, a stronger leadership. Leadership with a vision, and I would like to see that also from governments, with the ability, as we discussed, to connect. Because of course, if they have a vision, and nobody recognizes that as a good vision, and if you are lacking the skills to, to communicate that vision well with people, and people do not like your vision and vote on somebody else, who have a vision which is easier to embrace or whatever, then it won't happen. So I want them to show also their leadership. 
And I'm not saying that nobody is doing that. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that no country is doing that. I, I believe that by far most people in the world are very good people, regardless where they work. Um, but if I see the progress we make, we can challenge ourselves to do it a little bit better. If I look to this country, one of the richest countries in the world, having 4% of its energy coming from sustainable resources, where this polluting China is on 7, and the average of Europe is 8, then I think, hey, we can still make some progress. So where would you say companies already do things themselves and where is regulation needed? It, it, for me, and that's a good point. It's a very dangerous point, by the way. My most fellows in companies would say, oh, don't go that direction because we don't want more regulations. Um, and, um, and in general, you're not pleading for gender regulations. But like I showed with the discussion on, on conventions, I believe at the end of the day, the solution of this will be a tuning between companies who take their own responsibility but also embrace a certain level of new regulations. If we want to come to a real new design of our economy, and I proposed uh, differentiated uh, ways of dealing with taxations, and maybe taxations shifted from taxations on labor, which is maybe not the most logical thing to do, although most governments get 50% of their income stream connected to labor, but to taxes on resources. I mean, those kind of changes are, are, are possible. And I think uh, that governments here also need to play an important role in that. Companies cannot do that themselves. Thank you. Okay. There's a question over there. Yeah. Please. First of all, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, um, I'm sitting here as a, as a life scientist, and I'm just wondering, um, we made mistakes in the future, not only on the climate change, but also like, for example, increasing uh, obesity and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering if you look, for example, at China, India, the, the countries which were in the blue uh, figure, the increasing uh, <coughs> countries, they, um, as you see, not only on, on how, they, um, how they change in their, um, in their um, climate or like uh, in energy consumption, but also if you look at, uh, at the life science or at the obesity increasing in these countries, I'm just wondering as a small Europe as we are going to the left side of the, um, of the globe, how companies like DSM um, see their influence in these countries to, not, to let them not make the same mistakes as we did in the past. Very important question, and I think, that, again, also the answer will, of course, not be companies alone, but it will also be the responsibility of governments in those countries and consumers as well. And I think countries will do it in a different way. I am highly impressed on what is happening in China and the Chinese leadership. And I know you can say many, many things on China which uh, uh, is not good. Um, but you can also look to the things they do very carefully. And it has especially to do with the further development of their society. Of course, they want to grow the middle class. They want to grow the western part of China. And they need to do that. Because they cannot have only an eastern part of China, which is rich, rich and a western part not. That will jeopardize the stability of the country at the end of the day. So they want to grow economically fast as possible. And they're doing that. Building every week a new coal power plant, etc. But at the same moment, they have a higher percentage of renewable resources from the total energy than a country as the Netherlands has. Why? Because they realize also that if we do not take those measures, at the end of the day, it will limit our own growth, it will limit our own society, our own people will not be happy in many cities. Uh, I showed you the city in one of the slides, I don't know where you recognize it, uh, Ram Kolha's uh, building in uh, Beijing, uh, in uh, the mist. Um, um, so um, I think several, several uh, countries are really conscious of thinking about that. If you look to China, the same China, the scandals which happened with uh, especially milk products changed the behavior of the consumers. They do exactly what you proposed. The consumers in China raised very clearly by their own behavior, their voting, that this should change regardless what the government is doing and otherwise we will not buy from Chinese brands anymore. Full stop. This is what we do as consumers. 
And of course, that influences uh, companies. But at the end of the day, you're fully right. It is also companies. It is companies like us and there's other companies to try to develop the right products, what we do, to try to reduce uh, salt, to reduce fat, to reduce sugar, to uh, put omega-3 uh, fatty acids into the food, etc., to change our composition of food. Uh, if you talk, one of the things you mentioned, obesity. I mean, it is strange that at this moment, globally, 50% of the global pharmaceutical market is developing or is earning its money for medicines which are treating diseases which we have created ourselves very effectively in the last 30 years. When I was becoming, when, when I started working in the top 10 pharmaceuticals, there were five antibiotics. There are no antibiotics anymore in the top 20. It has all to do with diabetes, cholesterol, etc. cetera. Um, the diseases we have created ourselves by our own food pattern and now even raising healthcare. And by the way, we address those diseases very well because in the meantime, we become older as well. And it is, to a certain degree, a strange model. And we need to start with beginning of pipe to change our food composition, to change our patterns, etc., etc. And I think, yeah, we try to contribute to that. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely. Uh, do we do everything perfect? No. But I'm trying to, 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 to develop the right products with, for example, the uh, imprint of our products which we measure, ECO. Now, I did not mention that. We started with People Plus to look at the effects of our products for society. We have only screened 2% of our total portfolio yet. We are busy screening the total portfolio under certain criteria to see how our products uh, are contributing to society or not. And then putting again measures how to improve that over time. One second. Some people have got a hold of microphones. Um, I don't know, but let me let me give you your turn. Um, the business world is dominated by men. The questions were dominated by men. I'm going to give the mic to a woman. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, a great thank you for such a brilliant and really inspiring speech. Uh, my brief question actually will be started with a very brief story. So uh, in 2011, I started working for the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine, and I was responsible for coordinating four committees. One was fuel and energy, like Shell, Chevron, then KBP, all the great companies. Nice, real estate, travel and tourism. And finally, the CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Committee. The one I personally got the most excited about because I thought, yeah, it's the time of crisis, the time of change, the time for companies to rethink their policies and to move into more sustainable and more responsible way of behavior. So guess what? The, the biggest surprise, uh, very little was done in the framework of the CSR committee. And all the major emphasis was put on the uh, economic goals, economic profit, but in terms of yeah, developing in this direction, really very few. So uh, I'm thinking um, how to address this controversy and um, what were the sacrifices of the DSM to the economic crisis? Because I know that may, may, many companies cut, especially on CSR programs and green offices programs, which they consider not crucial to themselves, right? And um, in the time of the economic crisis, um, how do you manage to keep the scores and to keep this vision? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you said a lot, I think, uh, me. The essence is how can you be also sustainable during an economic crisis, an economic downturn? Yeah, so um, um, what did you sacrifice in the framework of economic crisis? Yeah. How do you manage to overcome well, not, not a lot, to be honest. When in 2008, uh, Lehman Brothers fell down and we were entering cost-saving program around the whole company, uh, in October, some of our businesses had zero sales turnover because the world stopped, automotive in the world stopped, more or less. So uh, we said, we need to save some cost here and there because uh, this is not going well. Um, September, October 2008. I got emails from a lot of people in the organization, but we will not stop with supporting the World Food Program. And I said, of course not. 
and you better not stop, she was I will not stop, but why, 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 why this message? Because we as employees want to sacrifice everything, but we are not going to tell to dying people in the world, sorry, we make a little bit less profit, therefore you should postpone your dying a little bit because we are not there at this moment. We cannot say that. And I was so proud that a lot of our own people were saying that to me, that it is not only carried by me and supported by me, but by many people in the organization. And I think, deeper to your point, um, and of course we have sometimes the same discussions, building a new factory in China. <laughs> Can you delete the wastewater treatment system? Some of our Chinese competitors do. Not all regulations are that clear. Would you do that at home? No, but maybe in China because of yeah, crisis, we all need to earn our money, right? Then we say, no, of course we do it now also. Because it touches a fundamental point. If you are willing to jeopardize your values when it counts, you have no values. Because the only moment that your values are tested is when it counts. When everything is okay, it's easy to live up to your values. Nobody has problems to live up to your values when everything goes smooth. Your values become values when they still are there when tested. And if you say at the moment that your values are tested, wow, well, listen, <laughs> we have a little bit difficult time. I mean, let's be pragmatic here. <laughs> then what about your values? So I'm very strong that our core values are not being jeopardized, even not when we are in difficult times. And by the way, I do not like anymore the word, word CSR. And I really hate it in Dutch. MVO, <laughs> maatschappelijk verantwoord ondernemen. Like there is also a niet maatschappelijk verantwoord ondernemen. Like there is also running a company without social responsibility. It should be close to criminal or something like that. Something like that. I do not want to be negative on anybody. But can you also run a company completely isolated from your social and, and, and environmental responsibility? So no, no, we have our company, that's one thing what we do. And separately, we do a certain things good. You understand? No, I don't understand at all. You have your company and that company should do its basic operation good. That is what we all talk about. Therefore, we switched it also many years ago from uh, a special uh, report, triple P report, to an integrated report. In other words, it served its purpose in the past to make that move. Today, I hope we are ending up in an area where we do not have to stress that, but it is a part of your normal operation. Next question. Okay, please. Um, you, you made a really nice parallel before between the 96% unsustainable, 4% sustainable energy distribution here in the Netherlands and the process of abolishing slavery in the US. It was really nice and really bold, but um, one thing, I mean, Lincoln managed to abolish slavery by winning, winning a war and by basically um, declaring slavery illegal by putting it in the Constitution. Now, uh, I know things here are not so radical, but do you see a path where things can happen in a, in a smooth way, or is it going to be a kind of a culture clash where regulation are going to have to be forced in uh, lawmakers to, to, to make things go one or the other way? Nobody would ever uh, advocate for war when blood is flooding and when people are killed, etc. Nobody. I would never uh, plead for that one. And I would hope that we also 200 years further now development and can do things in a, in a smarter way than, uh, than, than that one. That does not take away one word you used is force. And force can be in different ways. Uh, force can even be the voice on Facebook or whatever. Also that forces to exist or the view of consumers. Um, so I do not say I would be against that certain movements are there who help this world into the right direction. But no, I do not hope that we need any 
weapons. Uh, for no, that. The question was, never was more that. about regulations and forcing. I mean, do you think there's going to be the no, need I, to force I, regulations? I said that a few times. At the end of the day, it will be um, um, solutions which need to work, in which governments and companies need to work together. I do not think that one of the two, if you take his third group of consumers or NGOs with it, that one group has the almighty uh, power. The world is too complicated that every government, that every company should realize that the complicated problems we have in the world today cannot be solved by any single entity anymore. And that results into a more complicated system than maybe in the past, true, that is then the new reality, then hopefully we are more developed that we can let those different entities work together in a different way than maybe in the past when you had the kingdom and you had the king who's the boss and said, my law, that rules. Yeah, that's a pretty easy uh, and, and pretty clear also model. Um, we do not have that situation anymore and to a large degree also happy enough. Um, always at service yeah. for the university. Um, you, you said the world is changing. You said governments have to change, companies have to change, yet you didn't mention universities. What's with them? And second, talking about sustainability <laughs> and business, what do you expect of newly graduates? <laughs> nice question. Okay, here it goes. Universities. Um, we discussed that many times. Universities have three prime goals. Right? Education. <laughs> hey, great. People plan and profit. You're right. Come back to that. Um, three prime goals. One is education. Second, research and development. Right? Research and development. You research that you do in a university and education. You did not miss that, that you do education <laughs> at the university. Um, and those two are not three. So what is the third one? And my question to many universities is whether their contribution to society, like you mentioned, is clear and visible enough. And I think, of course, many universities give a contribution to society, maybe almost per definition already via the education and via research. But also raising their voice on certain debates of telling their opinion as free academics on certain topics is a very important role of the academic world and of universities. And of course they are doing that, and I'm not saying they're not doing that. But can they do that clearer? Can they do that with more visibility? Can they do that stronger? I think so. Would that be an important element? Absolutely. That's one. Secondly, if you come back to of the whole board here, so. Uh, this university is doing that. Say whatever you like. Okay. <laughs> this is, by the way, a great board who allows me also to say whatever I want, uh, embracing that academic uh, freedom. And uh, by the way, I know that those three people are very much aligned uh, with the three things I just mentioned. We even discussed that this evening about the raising of voices of, uh, of the academia. Um, Coming back to your second question, what about students? What about yourself? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but before I give the answer, what is your own opinion on that? What is your responsibility of this, next to consuming education and a good time? <laughs> oh, oh, I hear. There's not everybody agreeing. Maybe you are at least, you're the population of tomorrow. You're the people of tomorrow. Maybe some of you will be leaders of tomorrow. Some of you will be the followers of tomorrow. Some of you will be business leaders of tomorrow. Some of you will be governmental leaders of tomorrow. You have the best education of all people in the country, all compared to other countries. The highest level of education. You're the most expensive group to give that education to, and society is paying that for you, especially in this country. I mean, United States and the UK, you pay a lot about that yourself, but in this country, society pays by far most of your own education. So society paying your education, and you get the best education which is available. Okay. 
You remember what I was saying in the beginning? Impact, power, things you got. Responsibility. If you get almost for free, the oh, dangerous to say that to students. <laughs> we will do it for free. Okay. Uh, not fully paid education. If that is the model, and you have the best education. My answer to your question, which is a very correct question, there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. There's a lot of responsibility. If you get that education, if society is willing to pay for that, then I hope, and that I sincerely hope, that you take up the responsibility which goes together with that and help shaping this world for your own future. But before you know, and I talk about experience, you are as old as I am because I still feel that I'm one of you. If I look to age, then I say, well, don't kid yourself, Simisma. <laughs> You're much older. Nah, it was only a few years ago I was also there. Yeah, a little bit more than a few years ago, so it feels always that I was uh, still a student. But before you know, you're 50. And before you know, there's a next generation. And before you know, that generation is asking you what you did with your education, with your power, with your capabilities to contribute to this world. And I don't want to get you to home stressed and for sure not depressed. Um, but if you go home and think about, after all the beers or whatever, what you do, think about one second still about what you did this evening, then first of all, I'm grateful that you came here. You could also do something different. But you came here listening to me. And I'm grateful for that. If you would not come here, then it would have been different for me standing here for all those tears. <laughs> so I'm grateful that you came here. But I also hope that you think about, okay, this is a story about the issues of the world. This is a story how one company addressed this, with all pluses and minuses. This is maybe economic models or things we could go into the future. What about myself? What are you going to contribute to this? And all with different capabilities, all in different contexts, etc. But not nothing, and not consuming only the world. Because you're much too good educated to consume the world, my humble opinion. I think that's a wonderful conclusion of tonight. Thank, thank you very, very much. <laughs> um, at Maastricht University, um, we are always very grateful, and therefore we have gifts. And we also actually, it's warm, but outside we have free drinks. But that's for the students, uh, some information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful talk. And um, I hope, actually, I hope, actually, that we, that uh, the executive board or, and or myself um, can um, motivate you to come back. Maybe in a year. What do you think what, what your answer would be? Listen, uh, the academia, as we were discussing, is so yeah. important, and the university plays also an important role in the world. If you ask me to come back, whatever time period, I will be there. Excellent. We will do that. So. <laughs> and, then, and then one more uh, present. Um, you know we have Green Office, and that's a group of students, and now, actually, today, the first Master University Journal of Sustainability Studies, oh. with student papers came out. Okay. One for you. Thank you. And one to give away somewhere on the planet. Hey. Oh, that's okay, nice thank you very much, and let's have drinks. Thank you. Okay. One remark. Okay. One final remark. Thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you very much for the board of management of this university, which is a great university. And I really, I wish all of you, and especially the people for which you will shape the world, the next generation. I wish you a great journey. Thank you very much.